Hello, and welcome to another episode of Max Planck Florida's Neurotransmissions Podcast. I'm Joe Schumacher, joined by my co-host, Dr. Leslie Kogan. Leslie, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Very good. I'm, I'm really excited for today because we've got uh, a really interesting guest on our show today and our new neighbor, Dr. Rodrigo Pena. Uh, he's a new assistant professor at Florida Atlantic University in the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, Rodrigo, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So what, what's really um, uh, exciting about having you here is that for years, people have been talking about computational neuroscience hires at FAU for the benefit of the entire neuroscience community here. Every, we, we're a very strong experimental neuroscience community between Florida Atlantic University, Max Planck Florida, Scripps, UF Scripps. Um, but one thing that I feel like is lacking is somebody who can help to explain some of the nuances of the data that the experimentalists um, are bringing to the table here and, and sort of elevate the level of rigor behind our science. I feel like a, one of the formulas that many of us have sort of adopted in, through graduate school into postdocs into running labs is, you know, you do your experiments, they're very hypothesis driven, and at the end it's really great to have a conceptual model that explains all the different pieces, but that's difficult to do, especially in the brain where it's it's very complex. So my first question for you is, as one of these sort of pioneers in the realm of computational neuroscience for us locally, um, as well as just in the, the computational neuroscience world in general, what is computational neuroscience? So can we, can we take a step back and just ask the question of what is computational neuroscience? What isn't computational neuroscience? What are some like misconceptions about what it is? And as a computational neuroscience, what do you seek to do with regards to biological data? Right. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I can tell you that computational neuroscience is not working with computers in neuroscience. We can start there, but there's so much that we can do with computational neuroscience. And one of the things is bridging between different experiments. Um, for example, take the Max Planck uh, Florida Institute that you have here. Uh, I bet you have people working in many, many different experiments, many different levels, many different, um, they are recording different systems, different areas, but everybody is in a different lab and you have all those scales of organization that they are working on, maybe optogenetics, maybe uh, fMRI, but how is it that you can really connect those levels of organization? And uh, let's say you have some um, idea, some hypothesis, and you want to test that. So do you really need to do that in a living system, or is it possible that you can just have a proof of concept? And I guess that the word here is proof of concept, right? So computational neuroscience provides you uh, proof of concept, some ideas, testable hypothesis where you can really narrow down and, and give you a way of doing educated experiments, educated hypothesis. So, uh, there is a book I like very much. It's like The Little Prince. I probably heard mm -hmm. about that. And at the beginning of the book, the author draws um, like this snake. He was six years old, like, um, and he had this idea that the snake would swallow elephants and it would digest elephants for so and so long. And then he shows um, his drawing to some folks, and then they okay, what what is this? Is this a hat? Uh, it's it's not really. <laughs> A snake, and then he has to add some details, and he draws the elephant inside the, the the snake, and then, if you think about that, that's like a model in his mind, right? So what what is it that it is a model to him? That little drawing of a hat was a snake, but to others, he had to add details to a proof of concept, something. So this is exactly like what we do with computational neuroscience. You come up with the, a simplified idea of something that works for you, that you can provide examples, that you can explain a hypothesis, and then you do that with computational neuroscience, right? So another thing that uh, it's interesting to clarify is the name computational neuroscience. So there is a misconception that computational neuroscience is working with computers. Um, when actually we are thinking about the brain as 
um, assistant that can manipulate and transform information, like computing something. And we do use computers, but so do you. I bet you use computers every day and you're not computer scientists, right? Sure. So uh, that's the same for us. So we think of the brain as transforming, manipulating information, and we use computers, but we use theory, we use quantitative uh, measures, and we try to understand how the brain computes information, right? Yeah, so. I, I guess as a follow-up question, a little bit about your background. So you, your PhD is in physics applied to medicine and biology, is that right? right? Right, So explain a little bit about your trajectory, your sort of personal direction you've taken. What brought you to the realm of physics? What Was it an interest in specifically modeling biological processes using physics or principles from physics? Or did you start out as a a physics major, like, I want to be the next Einstein, I want to study relativity. What was the motivation early on in your career to get into that area? Yeah, so uh, before the PhD, I was doing an undergrad in medical physics. And, um, you know, when you're young, you don't really know what you want to do. So, <laughs> so, but for medical physics, you, you usually get involved with some hospitals. I have friends doing radiotherapy. And I remember I took an internship in the hospital, and I hated the environment. <laughs> so, and but I, it's I not really, for everyone. Yeah, for sure. but I, I really like it. Um, the classes that I was taking at the time, and there were classes in the lab and classes that were more theoretical. You had, for example, physics. You learn uh, uh, how to calculate. Um, the earth acceleration and so on. And then you have to go to the lab and you have to throw a ball like a hundred times from a certain height. And that part I hated. I really liked the theory <laughs> and the, the thing. And then um, there were some labs working with neuroscience and I heard about the lab working with computational neuroscience there. And I thought that was okay. There, this looks so interdisciplinary and I can do theory, I can do computer science, I can use physics, math, and still talk with biologists, but I don't have to touch anything. That's perfect, let, let me do that. And as an undergrad, I had the opportunity to go to Switzerland. Uh, so there was a scholarship that I got at the time. And I don't know if you are familiar with that, but they were starting the Blue Brain Project there at EPFL, and I took classes with some Really nice folks like Wolfram Gerstner, he has a book in computational neuroscience. Uh, and he Markram, he was working with that. And that was like, oh, okay, this is so cool. People are doing that everywhere. And when I came back, I started the PhD in computational neuroscience and I, I focused on from there on everything in computational neuroscience. Yeah. <laughs> So is it fair to say that your interest was kind of in the realm of like using equations to describe biological phenomena at various scales with the purpose of understanding how the brain computes things, like how information is processed in the brain? Is that kind of what got you to the stage you're at right now? Yeah. So it's not a question only in the brain. So in physics, um, there is quantum mechanics and relativity. So there is not a connection. I mean, you can describe uh, quantum mechanics and then people study black holes and everything, but uh, nobody really knows what happens inside a black hole because then laws of physics go. And then um, in the brain, that's the same stuff. So you don't have a theory that as, as I, you saw my presentation today, mm -hmm. so it, people talk about the epilepsy, okay, they record at the scope of the brain, the cell, EEG, but you see pharmacological companies trying to develop um, interactions at the level of uh, channel. Uh, so those medicine, they go to that level. So there is some build up, some complex systems going on that you really need to understand how it goes. And um, there sort is- Sort of like, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but like sort of like how abnormalities at the level of a single ion channel or expression of an ion channel would extrapolate into a network-wide dysfunction like epilepsy. That's exactly, your, yeah. exactly. So so you really need those bridges, right? So those, um, so a computational, computational neuroscience guy, he can not only make models for a single 
uh, level of organization, but he can connect different levels. So he can develop models where I explain something from a channel to a synapse to a network. So he can really be uh, intermediate those labs, so to say. Yeah. So that's really interesting. How close are we to actually being able to sort of bridge across all of the levels of neuroscience? Like, are we able to, using computational analysis, you know, maybe model the effect that like a pharmacological drug that affects an ion channel might have on things like cognition and behavior? Yeah, so there are, for certain issues, there are, um, I can tell you, Many of my friends are now working in pharmacological, um, pharmaceutical companies. So, because they have dedicated people doing that in uh, systems that study a specific drug, but it's always like uh, focused to solve a particular problem, like a, this, um, let's test this or that. And this is done in every single area. We think about simulations in the brain, but for example, airplanes, uh, people don't they build an airplane, they don't fly that uh, right away. So they do computer simulations. So that's something that um, we've seen in all different areas. So you test uh, in a simulation, then you you try it again. And also, I mean, there is the advantage that, that this is, uh, there's something funny, but I, at some, there was one time I was giving a talk about computation neuroscience in this um, um, conference. And there were some students that they were studying. They, they were, I, I don't know how you call it here, but it's like ethics for experiments. Mm -hmm. And I was telling them, oh, you can do all those levels of organization. You can model that. I think that I, I push it too much about <laughs> what we could do. And they came to me asking if we should do some group that would ethically look at what we are doing like are we killing neurons in the computer are we <laughs> like that, so have you gotten a, a sentient enough simulation of a biological process the point where you'd have to worry about taking care of it basically exactly so like an eye cook is... for uh for computers basically. yeah yeah <laughs> i really hope that we're several years away from that um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could you can convince me otherwise um i guess you know wh one thing to sort of piggyback off of what Leslie was asking about bridging these different levels from ion channels to cognition. Um, <clears throat> you can imagine a very simple problem for a pharmaceutical company would be like, okay, if, if this person has this point mutation in this specific uh, receptor in the brain, <clears throat> um, maybe what you would expect to see is this kind of behavioral phenotype. And if you make a compound that addresses that particular mutation or whatever and rescues behaviorally what's going on in the animal, that might be good for selling a drug, but it doesn't actually seem like it gives us much of an understanding of what happens between those two vastly different scales in the brain. So <clears throat> it seems like computational neuroscience um, allows you the opportunity to fill in some of those gaps potentially. Like if you're talking about really small scale stuff and really big scale stuff, um, it might be interesting to know the impact of that small change at multiple levels leading up to the overall desired effect. Is that kind of like what you're talking about? Is that, is that yeah. sort of part of the goal? Yeah. But, um, just one clarification is that, um, we are never the final answer. So, um, I cannot make a simulation and I say, okay, use that drug. So you have to go through the, the, the process of testing that it, it's going. It's certainly going to save you time because if I, I, I can. I, you don't need to kill a hundred rats or mice or something to test an idea that you had overnight. Sure. But I can do that in a simulation, and you can get rid of that idea right away. Yeah. So you say, okay, this is certainly not going to work. So for those types of problems, it's very useful, and. It gives you an educated way of testing things, you know, so you narrow down to uh, more specific problems. Right? Yeah. yeah, it gives you, a, you know, a way to sort of refine their experiments and exactly. guide their experiments. Yeah. And yeah. also um, from your talk this morning, one thing that I really appreciated, which, um, you know, I think mostly about computational neuroscience is guiding and helping us to understand our data. But you've also pointed out a good point where often you can extract more data than the experimenter might have been able to see 
originally, and you talked about this cross-correlation. Maybe you could give us a little overview of, of that experiment and what you were able to extract from that data. Right, so there, um, you imagine that you have two neurons, and because w when they are recording in the brain, um, it's very difficult to say if two neurons are connected. It's not the brain, they're so, in so many neurons. And people have been developing techniques to do that. So, and then if you know a very, if you have a very refined technique, then you can start building maps of certain areas. Um, but having the map is not the only thing. So maps are populated by neurons. Neurons are populated by uh, ion channels. So they have, and they are different. So there's some specificity, specificity there. And what I did was that, okay, I take the very same data that you are using to see if neurons are connected, but I can also extract another piece of information that is, what are those types of neurons? What is it that they contain in terms of ion channels? So it's going to save you a lot because you're not going to do more experiments to do that, but you just use the same piece of information and you look into another angle, right? So that's more or less how it works in that direction, yeah. yeah. I have a question about that sort of interaction between the experimentalist and the, the computational neuroscientist. So, you know, presumably this group has collected, uh, you know, maybe extra, extracellular recordings from dozens of neurons and they can do these sort of cross-correlation analysis to see like, is the timing right that these would be highly likely to be probabilistically connected or driven one driving the other, for instance. Um, and then you come back and say, well, not only that, but if, if we assume this sort of model underlying the activity of those neurons, it would suggest that these are two different types of cells with these different physiological properties. Does that then cause the experimentalist to go back and actually look at, you know, protein expression in these cells to see if like they are in fact different or um, how much of that sort of underlying assumption, model-based assumption about cell types then becomes the next round of experiments? And, and in your experience, um, when you're working with an experimentalist on a specific question, um, it seems like there's a lot of questions you might be interested in analytically that sort of, sort of drift from the initial reason why they went in to make those recordings in the first place. So what is that dynamic like working with an experimentalist when you're building collaborations and trying to find something that's interesting for you and useful for the experimentalist? Ideally, it seems like there'd be like a real back and forth where your analysis would be driving more experiments from them and, and that sort of thing. How do you build a relationship like that with another scientist, essentially? Right. So um, there is this uh, language issue that I always say that is a language issue. Um, and I, I, I think I gave this example uh, early today, but um, uh, science decided that we would do things in English. And <laughs> I'm not a native English speaker, but I had to learn English and I have to speak English. I don't know if you like my English, but that's <laughs> great. <laughs> but, so far, yeah. but but that's now I'm from physics. Um, I I can do physics, math, computer science, and I want to work with you. Do you do neuroscience? Should I come here and show you uh, physics to work with you? That's not the way, right? Yeah, actually, okay. your talk had no equations in it today at exactly. all, which I, I found very helpful because Amazing. it meant that I could sort of just focus on conceptually what it is you're trying to solve. And exactly. So the way, the same way if I go, I, my native language is Portuguese. I can go, uh, come here at the Max Planck, and I can give the beautiful talk in Portuguese. I think you won't understand, right? Right. So that's the same for uh, presentation without equations. It gives me a lot of work. It's not easy, but I have to focus on the ideas and what is it that it is interesting for you as a neuroscientist, and then I can work on the background and try to explain. So that's like the uh, back and forth. I try to make this communication with you, and then I try to understand what are your problems in your language, and I bring solutions to you for that. And you know, it's like a, it's a little bit of politics. You go 
on different labs, you talk to people, see their lab meetings, what are what is it that they are interested. Usually there is always some quantitative analysis that is lacking and you say, okay, maybe I can do that. I can propose a model. You can see that it goes more or less like this, you know, so. So yeah. maybe we can actually expand on that a little bit more. Um, you know, if there are maybe trainees or students listening to this podcast who are interested in becoming computational neuroscientists, um, what sort of skills outside the obvious, like the technical, the mathematical skills, what sort of skills do you think have really served you well um, in, you know, being able to form these types of relationships or, or other things that you do in your do job? Yeah, so... I would say that you need to like interdisciplinary work a lot because you're not going to be reading biology or doing experiment. You have to go on all of those different levels and there's always a new tool. Sometimes you have to deal with math. Sometimes you have to deal with computer science, but things are getting easier nowadays. So there's chat GPT all around and even that's just one example, but um, computational modeling is getting easier and easier. So it's not, when I was a PhD student, it would take months to do a network that today I can do in a day. It's not that difficult anymore. People are developing tools. So, but you need to have this um, interdisciplinary um, idea that you want to do. And you need to communicate well because it's all about interacting with other people. You cannot have a lab, sit in a table and do your work because you're going to do theoretical work, mathematical work, and nobody's going to understand and care about. So you really need to go and come here to the Max Planck, show yourself and talk to people, see what are the problems. So it's a type of area that you need very good communication. Yeah, And I'm a very shy person. I don't know if you noticed <laughs> that, but I still, trying to put myself out and do the job, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing um, that I've seen, you know, since the time I was in grad school to, till now is a real leap forward in terms of like open access to existing tools, like toolboxes in Python and things like that, or open source software and things that are really helpful for experimentalists who are okay with sort of a black box solution to some kind of problem they have. How much in, in the world of computational neuroscience are you relying, do you feel like, um, and I don't know how old you are, but like, if you think about your, your career arc from, you know, when you took introductory physics to now, how much have you had to try to keep up with technological advancements that are useful, like in terms of, you know, um, uh, approaches for doing clustering analysis or like, you know, uh, segmenting out categorizing different patterns of electrical activity in the brain or that sort of thing. How much of the, of the task of being a computational neuroscientist is like staying up and current on like what's out there and what people are doing versus falling back on your area of expertise, the techniques and approaches you've typically taken. I feel like in the experimental world, if I was, you know, handy at the bench, I could read somebody's paper on like the latest tissue clearing or, you know, you know, viral vectors for expressing X, Y, and Z in the brain, and I could make it happen. I wouldn't have had to have done a PhD using those tools to adopt them. Is there any kind of analogy in the world of computational neuroscience in terms of staying current and, you know, being able to address new questions? Does that still require new techniques and approaches that you are constantly trying to learn? Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think that at the beginning, it was more difficult because, as I as I mentioned in my other response, uh, the computer languages they were uh, more difficult to learn. So I remember I was doing C, C plus plus, and um, so it would take ages, and there are all so and so many issues, long codes, but. As the time goes by, languages are getting easier. So you, we have Python and people are developing libraries. So if you're not, the one thing is that if you're not careful, you are using libraries and techniques that you don't understand about. And that's the trouble, that's the thing. So sometimes you really have to spend the time studying a particular technique, like machine learning. 
So you can do machine learning in one single line of code nowadays. So you can get the data, plug it there, and it's going to give you a beautiful plot. But the meaning behind that, it will take time. And that's something that I'm trying to keep up with. Yeah. So is, is this is the common problem just using other people's code and making yeah. sure you understand that you're yeah, using it the right sure way? Yeah, making sure you understand. There's, a, there's, there's something called module DB for computational neuroscience. science. So people put... Um, codes there for models because you know everybody has a different system a different uh, neuron you can go there and get a perm to sell from the ca1 it's perfect but you need to spend time and look at the code understand what you're doing you know you're brand new here in the jupiter campus starting your um, work at fau what are you most excited at diving into right so um, in terms of projects, you say. Sure. So um, there is a project I'm very excited, which involves reinforcement learning, which is a, a, an area like this machine learning type of stuff that I was not involved with before. And imagine that you have those Atari games that people uh, played back in the days. And there are some games that involve some visual and motor tasks. Um, there is one in particular that's called a card pole, and I, I actually had a friend working with that. So basically you have a pole and you need to equilibrate the pole just pressing left and right. And you can do that with artificial neural networks. They can be trained to solve those tasks. But if you have a neurobiological network and you train this network to play that game, it's like to receive the visual stimulation from observing the pole and then motor action pressing left or right. How is it that the learning process is going to take place there? What is it that, what are the neurons that are going to focus, focus on the visual stimuli, on the motor action? So there is a, a whole bunch of questions that uh, we can go from there. And there are some people here that I know, you know, that are very interested in glia cells as well. And we want to couple that with glia cells because they are also connected with synaptic plasticity. There's a whole new area of computational glial science that people are talking about. I love that, computational yeah, glial science. Yeah, people have been coming <laughs> with so and so many names, but but yeah, but that those are things that I'm very interested in doing, yeah. Um, you, you, you made a distinction that I think is is kind of interesting and um, maybe would kind of just fly under the radar for most experimentalists uh, or most computationalists, but maybe an experimentalist would potentially not have picked up on, which is an artificial like deep network or something that could be trained to equilibrate a pole that's like leaning one way or another versus a biologically plausible network that you've trained to, to do this sort of thing. So what is the distinction there between an artificial neural network and an artificial network that is neurons, but has more to it than just like a, a you know, a fully connected or multi-layered deep learning model. So what is, what is the bio, what, 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 is, what distinguishes the biologically inspired or biologically plausible model from a typical deep network type thing? Right, so that's a great question. Uh, so machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, those guys, they are stealing names from neuroscience uh, all right. over. Uh, they talk about supervised learning, and supervised learning, reinforcement learning. This does, you can think about uh, Pavlov, all that type of stuff. This is all neuroscience. And they have networks that can learn to do things they call it networks. Um, the components, they call them neurons, but they are mathematical functions. And the functions are connected and they call these connections synapses and weights. So you start talking about that, you know, okay, we are talking about neuroscience when actually this is all, those, those are all uh, mathematical functions with no real relation. You cannot really, oh, okay, I'm going to stimulate this, I'm going to record this. You cannot address with a neurobiological question. So this is an artificial neural network. I put the artificial, just, okay, this mm -hmm. is artificial. Now, uh, neurobiological uh, 
biologically grounded network comes from Hodgkin Huxley, you know. So those guys, they did the experiment in the 1950s. They fitted um, ion channels. They talk about action potentials. There is a circuit. There is a, there is always some uh, one-on-one, some, some, some way of testing that experimentally if you want. So if you plug that together and you have real synapses that people have, also fitted experimentally, and then you build a real network, then the learning takes place with synaptic plasticity, which is something else. So that's the language of neuroscience. And so it's kind of like the artificial neural networks don't have to worry about sodium and potassium conductances no. or membrane time constants or like electrical properties of individual cells, right? And right. what you're talking about is in the realm of if we want to build a simulation of the biophysical properties of a cell and embed that in a network, that's what you're talking about distinguishing from these right, artificial right. networks. Yeah. It's not that it's not happening in silico or in a in simulation, it is. It's just that it happens to be grounded with what we understand about how neurons work, right? Exactly, so if you want to understand how the brain works, you need to do a computational neuroscience. And <laughs> so I, I, I gave, I, like I remember again giving these courses and oftentimes someone comes to learn computational neuroscience in a course, in a conference, and he's expecting to learn machine learning. And I get those questions a lot and they say, why are we not classifying things? Why are you talking about ion channels? And then I have to come up mm -hmm. with this explanation. Okay, there's a distinction of areas. This is artificial neural networks, machine learning, and this is computational neuroscience. Computational neuroscience is always some question related to the brain, to some biology. Yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, it, it speaks to something that we've been doing in the classroom around here on campus. Um, at the undergraduate level, for instance, you know, we have been finding that undergrads are really talented self-taught programmers in a lot of cases here. And that can be really useful in labs where you're trying to adopt open source tools into your workflows and that sort of thing. So we've offered a course that's very focused on machine learning and statistics and categorization and, um, uh, and AI and deep learning for the purpose of building tools that are helpful for experimentalists to mm -hmm. um, analyze their data. On the other hand, one thing that's lacking is education towards the students for understanding how do you build biophysical models of how the brain works. Right. That's where I feel like the next level is for us locally. I mean, this this is a worldwide podcast, like people around the world listen to this, but in South Florida right now, what we really want to do is elevate the level of, um, broaden the, the, the access that students have to leveraging these, these domain, people who are interested in physics, data analysis, math, combining all that stuff to be to the benefit of the neuroscience community here I feel like is is um, really important and I you know I w I think that's why there's so much excitement around you joining us here because yeah, I'm super uh, happy. <laughs> not just in terms of the research um, you know helping to elevate the research and allow experimentalists to build models of uh, you know how cognitive functions happen in animals like how decision making takes place reinforcement learning all that stuff but also like for the students, I feel like it's a game changer because um, it brings, you know, it br a lot of times what, what we're teaching is data science for people who are interested in neuroscience. And what we want to really do is train people in neuroscience so that they can sort of help us understand how the brain computes things. And, right. um, you know, on that note, with your lab opening up here in Jupiter, what are you looking for in people who for joining your team? Are you are you recruiting at all right now at the level of undergrads, grad students, postdocs? What are you, what are sort of some of your priorities for putting a team together to to help you work on this stuff? Are you a lone wolf? Are you going to do this all by yourself? <laughs> no, I I actually have a postdoc coming, so wow. he's he knows Patch Club, uh, and he had an an experience with computational neuroscience. So those are the type of people that I want, like as people can kind of bridge experiment and yeah, that and theory. can help me bridge those experiments. And exactly. So and there is a lot of training that I want to do. Also, I understand that as you're saying, um, we need to to start the foundation. So I would like to start some boot camps. And um, we've been talking in the background about 
classes, join classes. So that is a way of getting people interested, but this takes time. So I'm, I'm bringing people that could be interested like from the high levels, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, you know, these educational opportunities locally that you're excited about starting. Um, I wanted to also give you an opportunity to talk about um, this last con, uh, Latin American School in Computational Neuroscience, which I think you actually went to as an attendee originally and now are involved in the organization and instruction of. Right. Yeah. So last con. So I'm also going to make a clarification because someone okay. asked me but it's not related to the army or anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said that uh, you get, it looks like you are in the army or because it's so intensive and- that, 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 It's like a boot camp kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, it's a boot camp. So it, it, it's every other year uh, in January, an entire month. So there are some applications they bring, um, People from everywhere, from the U.S., from Europe, are very good people, like experts in computational science. You have classes from Monday to Saturday in the morning. In the afternoon, you have tutorials, hands-on tutorials, and you need to present a project at the end of the, the thing. So you, you spend evenings working also in the, your projects, and so it's like they're in the army, right? So... Uh, I was in this um, last con in 2018 or 16, I don't know, I don't remember, but, but it was like a, um, it's something, those things that change your life and the people that I met there, you spend a month with them so they get friends forever, they become your friends forever and, and I know people everywhere, sometimes we meet in conferences and everything and this time I was invited to be in the organization. So that's why I'm trying to spread the word. I think that, and there's people sometimes are afraid of going because they have never touched uh, coding. And, but there, and the first week is all about teaching people experimentalists. And the last project, it's a group of two. And they, they encourage you to make groups like someone that comes from computer science with some experimentalists. So there is this interaction and it's, it's, I cannot recommend enough. It's really good. Yeah. So it's in January, it's in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. That's another thing. You cannot encourage you enough <laughs> to go there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, I think things like that are, are phenomenal opportunities for people, especially when they're structured with experimentalists in mind. I feel like you're right. There is kind of this, you know, we want friends in computational neuroscience because it's like having a friend with a boat. You don't want to get a boat yourself. You don't want to have to be the person who has to take care of it and cultivate this knowledge. Having a friend in computational neuroscience is, is really helpful yeah. for an experimentalist. But if you have an entryway where, you know, there's not this expectation that you're going to have a specific type of mathematical or physics background just to get started, then it's a really great opportunity. Um, so... Um, we will put a link to the, the conference um, in the, the description of this podcast so people can check it out. We have the technology to do that, right, Engineer Kevin? Okay, perfect. Um, oh, wait, can we do this? Uh, where, where's my camera? Right here. This is the box uh, where we're going to put a little ad for, for LastCon 2024. Um, um, Dr. Payne, so, so, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. We're going we're gonna to wrap it up there, but i um, really looking forward to having you on campus now going forward and really excited to see what kind of collaborations come out of uh, having you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Great, great to have you. Thanks for watching today. If you like this video podcast, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool neuroscience.